Transmitter on? For the uh, audio? Property owner, wish, property owner wishing to address the council? Mr. Lamb? Barbara Lamb, 99 Lambtown Road. 
Uh, up and coming, you're going to be looking at a street for acceptance, uh, start of view. Uh, there has been some test borings that were done. The report is out. The road has been found to be insufficient for asphalt and other numinous uh, deficiencies in the building of the road and the sinking of the road and some other issues with the drainage. So hopefully that we can cut it short. I'll give you the report. You probably already got it. Goes along with the pictures. This was done on January 10th. So you can see before the snow hit, this was the town council. Uh, the correspondence and everything are in that package. And hopefully, if there is needed assistance, I have been in touch with Tilcon, which is a asphalt supplier. American Paving out of Plainfield is another company. These people have had numerous years of experience. They would like to come and look at the job. If you have some problems of getting it corrected, uh, according to Ordinance 45, the thickness, the depth, the drainage, whatever else is on that. So I would be able to help you with that. The other question we're making short this week is, do we have any idea if the leak has been found and repaired in the town uh, hall and the buildings? No. Nothing? Not yet. Not as when we discussed it. On the I know that, but I mean, has City of Rotten offered to help? I know that the town engineer has been in contact with the property utilities to see if they can assess the fire needs. So it's up and coming. Uh, I got other documentation if you need it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lamb. Is there anyone else? Mike Cherry? Hi, Mike Cherry, by Brookville Drive. Really, I'm here to chair the Planning and Zoning Commission. I wanted to make sure everybody understands that we have canceled tomorrow night's meeting. Uh, and Everything that was on tomorrow's agenda will show up on the agenda for the end of the month. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anybody else? Mr. Monaghan? Thank you. I'm Ed Monaghan, 49 Homestead Road. And uh, for those of you who are in the Finance Committee, this may be a little bit like Groundhog's Day, 10 days late, because I will be repeating some of the comments that are made in the public comment period there uh, half an hour ago, an hour ago. Specifically, I wish to comment on tonight's new business under the Finance Committee. It's item one. Now, things may have been transpired uh, since I wrote these, but I, I think I should deliver these remarks. And I'll, I'll basically read them to keep within the three minutes. I wish on my behalf and that of the Southeastern Connecticut Water Authority, of which I am the chairman, to request that you not at this time authorize the mayor to execute a three-year contract with Groton Utilities for the operation of the ledger WPCA water systems, and not at this time grant a bid waiver to Groton Utilities. Given that when the operation of the ledger WPCA water system was, first put, was last put out to bid, that's almost four years ago, or actually the bid was four years ago in 2010, the Southeastern Connecticut Water Authority was one of two public water utilities deemed qualified to reliably operate this system. That's a benchmark. You don't want to deal with anybody who isn't qualified to do that, but we were found that. And given that Squaw has recently informed the town of Ledyard in writing that it wishes to now submit a bid for the operation of the Ledyard water system for the next three year period, we therefore believe that the town should, without delay, publish a public RFP, Request for Proposals for the Operation of the Ledger WBCA Water Systems, so that SCWA and any other public water utilities deemed qualified can tender bids. We are confident, it's basic economics, that an open bid process is in the best interest of the town of Ledger and the customers of, of the Ledger WBCA and will result in significant annual savings. On your agenda as well, the town council will be discussing an ordinance modification for purchasing that would allow a threshold for mandatory competitive bidding to be raised to $25,000. It seems unconscionable 
that you would be considering at the same meeting a bid waiver to allow the term to purchase services for an excess of $935,000 without seeking competitive bids. I, I honestly, I am perhaps naive, but I don't understand that process. SCWA, a ledger-based water utility, already provides quality, reliable, potable water to about half of the households in Ledger that rely on public water systems. And we are confident that we can, without breaking stride, take up the responsibility for, the re for reliably supplying potable water to the other half of the households on water systems in Ledger, i.e. those served by the Ledger WPCA system. Given that our bid in 2010 was for considerably less than the bid eventually accepted by the town, close to $100,000 less, we have every reason to believe that our bid in 2014, if we're given the opportunity to bid, will result in economies of tens of thousands of dollars a year, year after year, uh, not only uh, to the ledger WPCA, to it, but to its customers and also to the town as a whole. I think at a time when the town is under pressure, uh, deferred uh, increases for education, many of the other things that I hear at meeting after meeting, you want to be and to be seen to be uh, careful with your money. And why you don't put this out to bid is a conundrum. And I hope that indeed, in due course, you will recognize the validity of these arguments. And Mary, I think I've run out of my slides here that I just wanted to talk to briefly. Um, let me explain. This, these are numbers that are taken from the Connecticut Department of Labor uh, for the town of Ledger. Um, the first number shows the workforce for the town of Ledger. Those people who are working, actively seeking work. Um, and the second number shows the number of people who are employed in the town of Ledger. The third number is the number of people who are unemployed in the town of Ledger. And the last number is the percentage, 6.9%. Next slide, please. Interestingly enough, if you go back five years, you'll see that we had a workforce of 8,680 as compared with 7,874 at the close of 2013. So we have, a, we have dropped 806 per persons in our workforce in the town of Ledger. Um, that's a 9.3% drop since 2008. And yet we're still only listed at 6.9% unemployment. As far as I can tell, looking at the census numbers, we have not had a significant population drop in the town of Ledger. Next slide, please. Now, if you understand how they count the labor force, they do not count those people who are no longer actively seeking work. They may be people who could work. They may be people who, I mean, there may be people out there who could work but are not actively seeking work because their unemployment benefits have run out and they're no longer counted in that number. So there's a potential that the unemployment rate in the town of Ledger is probably more like 11 or 12 percent, not 6.9 percent. Of course, we do have some people who have moved into retired status, meaning that they now have probably more of a fixed income. Um, but at any rate, a lower workforce means that there is a greater tax burden on fewer wage earners. So the more we raise taxes, and lower the workforce, those people are paying a greater percentage. Last slide, please. We keep getting told that the economy is getting better and better and better. And yet last Friday, the AP reported, you know, and AP is not necessarily known as a conservative group, 
This is a quote from them. In the four and a half years since the Great Recession ended, millions of Americans who have gone without jobs or raises have found themselves wondering something about the economic recovery. Is this as good as it gets? It increasingly looks that way. Friends, I know that we can't stay at a zero increase forever. But I do believe it behooves us to be absolutely as responsible as we possibly can because the numbers that are being thrown around out there are probably not real. And, the, and people are hurting a lot more than the pundits would like us to believe. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilor Gabordi? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Eichberg, for your, for your uh, data there. It's uh, something that I think is extremely important that we consider everything along the way. And as we begin to find out what our actual needs are for next year, I, I think uh, the fact that some people will have very difficult time meeting any increase is something we should consider. Uh, just a, a couple of uh, quick things, though. Um, uh, in, in principle, I agree entirely. But uh, there will also be increases in certain costs that are outside of our control. And we will not at the same time be able to say, therefore, we're just not going to do as much work on the roads or you know, continue to fund whatever program we're talking about. So as difficult as it is, as costs go up, that will also have to be considered. Uh, on, and I meant to ask you about this before the meeting, Steve, mm -hmm. so I apologize. When it says greater tax burden on fewer income earners, I think it was uh, the uh, next to the last slide, or maybe the last slide. Uh, the tax burden, uh, since, since our local taxes are not income taxes per se, uh, the taxes stay the same on the properties sure. in which they live. So in determining whether or not the tax burden is greater for any individual taxpayer, that's not really that difficult if you look at what they paid in taxes last year and this year. The ability to pay may be affected, but uh, I just wanted to make the point that the uh, tax burden... Well, let me, let me clarify when I say income earners, <coughs> I'm talking about those people in the job force. Mm -hmm. And that number seems to be dropping. Right, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with you, and I don't want to make this sound like a disagreement. My only point is uh, that... The tax burden is not something we have to think about and figure out to determine what it is. We can look at actual numbers of taxes due last year, this year, next year, what it happens to be. And those stay the same regardless of the people's income or employment. That's my only point. Sure. Anybody else? Councilor Sons? Um, so I just wanted to comment with yet another winter storm on the way. <laughs> And I appreciate the work that's been done by the uh, Department of Public Works and the drivers. Um, I think they've done a great job keeping the roads open. We've had long storms. We've had frequent storms. We've had a lot of cold weather where the roads are freezing even without snow on them. So just compliments to the uh, Department of Public Works. Okay. Councilor Allen? Yeah, as we come into our uh, budget season, uh, the Finance Committee finding it's going to be a challenging year this year, probably one of the most challenging we've experienced yet. And uh, and Chairman Davis had said uh, some time back that uh, you know we need bold ideas this year, and we're we're coming out with bold ideas. Uh, and I would say that we would want bold ideas from anybody in town, um, whether it's uh, ways to curb our spending, efficiencies that we can find. But if you if you know of something that makes you think it can make sense. I'd welcome anybody to present those ideas to any one of us, anybody in the town, so that we can uh, vet that idea out and see if it's something that can help us. Because we're going to have our hands full this year. Okay, I'd like to uh, just make a couple of uh, announcements. Um, Ledge Light Health District is sponsoring a smoking cessation program. It is free, and it will include a nicotine, repla nicotine replacement therapy. So if anybody is interested in taking their starting in March, just call um, Ledge Light Health District. Also, last night at the library, um, informational sessions began on uh, probate and estate planning. Um, there's three more in um, March and April. 
You don't have to sign up ahead of time and uh, walk in as well. I've just called the Bill Library for the times. And um, the AARP, that's the Association of Retired People, is conducting a free tax preparation at the Ledger Senior Center. Again, you just need to call up and make an appointment. And I think the minimum age is um, 50 years old. <laughs> They will do your taxes as long as they're not too um, complicated. Okay. okay, moving on, um, we'll have the review and approval of um, the uh, minutes, special minutes of January 22nd and regular meeting minutes. Do I hear so moved. Second. discussion on the water operations contract that uh, Mr. Monahan uh, alluded to in his own comments, uh, resident comments. We withdrew that uh, motion and we'll be addressing it again at our next meeting. But essentially, we've been operating under a month-to-month -month and a year contract with uh, Black Utilities. They're uh, looking to proceed with a three-year contract uh, for uh, water service in the town. Finally, uh, Considering for some time, based on a change to state statute in the past legislative session, that authorized uh, related to purchasing when uh, competitive bids were required. Our previous ordinance, as authorized by the state, authorized a limit of $7,500. Anything above $7,500, you had to go out for a competitive bid. Uh, that can be a very costly process for towns. The state statute authorized an increase to $25,000 had to be changed within the ordinance for the town. Uh, we reviewed uh, during the last council uh, session what expenditures there had been uh, over the past several years and came to middle ground and authorized an increase from 7500 to 15000 We still remain with the $5,000 threshold to require three quotes for, uh, but we would not require a competitive bid to reach the $15,000 threshold. And what that will allow is greater flexibility among the departments to, uh, to come with a, uh, with a bid. Okay, thank you. Um, information technology. Information uh, technology met uh, Tuesday, last Tuesday. Uh, got the, went through the uh, MIS director's report. Uh, she's added the tax collected to the building permit process to verify that uh, when somebody applies for a building permit that they have no one paying taxes so that we get lost. The MIS department has also worked with the town clerk to 
this is developing emergency operations plans and found information technology equipment, which would include the MIS director's report. Uh, we're still continuing to discuss backup generator power source for town hall. Uh, that will also be able to maintain all the town of infrastructure and uh, information technology systems. Um, implement thing. If IT committee also discussed the fact that the EBA as far as their efforts and work that they've been working on. Um, as it also was discussed, the 2008 that Mr. Lambert uh, spoke about during the public comments, uh, which I was not aware of, but apparently uh, there's a 1,200 gallon per day discrepancy between the meters that at the Legend Center School with the water line feeds the town hall complex. Um, the issue with that is the design for the septic system capacity station. So Ledge Light has said if you get the actuals of what the water usage is at each of the town, at each of the uh, buildings, then we can go and decide the septic system based upon that, which is what we've been doing. But in the meantime, we are working with uh, Ledge Light uh, and uh, Rotten Utility to identify the, where the leak is uh, unknown at this point. Uh, probably what's going to happen is during the upgrade when we build the fire uh, the new police station, there are two water stuffs that be that were installed when the 117 water line was placed. Uh, so one water line would feed town hall and another one would just uh, feed the Anderson line itself. Um, so that's coming in the future and then we can turn off the water line coming from the school. Uh, we also briefly discuss the progress of status and enforcement of light. snow day cancellation so far. But as of today, the graduation date has not yet been affected. Uh, our LHS Quahog Bowl team, which is a marine science knowledge competition team, uh, took both individual honors and team sportsmanship awards, which is a very common occurrence for our high school team. They really do a wonderful job. Uh, Board of Ed complimented our, uh, the uh, Board of Ed maintenance staff on the job they've done with the significant amount of school cl uh, snow clearing. Uh, they also indicated that with the advent of other local school districts producing advertising to attract students and families, we're discussing various ways that we can promote our district. I don't know if any of you have seen these, but some are very professional. I saw one for a local district recently. I don't want to do any more advertising for it uh, <laughs> than what it's doing for itself, but uh, it's an interesting thing with the advent of school choice. Uh, even now, public schools competing for their results. Uh, LEAF president, uh, Beth Peterson, discussed some upcoming grants. They continue to be extremely generous. There are a couple of mini grants, which are about $1,000. But among other things, they're also buying iPad labs for every one of the schools, which is a, a 
pretty big deal. Um, the uh, regarding uh, there was a great deal of discussion about the budget, uh, state reimbursement funds, and others being cut. Mr. Strickland, uh, uh, chairman of the finance committee, uh, noted that the question of how parents can help has come up, and he said that since the state is not meeting its commitment to the municipalities, which has cost Ledger over seven hundred thousand dollars this year. He encourages people to write our state representatives and senator, and he encourages them to use some of this year's surplus to more fully support the towns. To this end, all necessary addresses will be posted on the Board of Ed website. Our elementary renovate is new, would receive a state reimbursement of 62.5%. Our town's cost is not yet known. We won't know that until we know how much the building would cost. Uh, if it were new construction, it would be reimbursed at a rate of 52.5%. Uh, the board indicated that additional funds for considering a new middle school in Ledger Center, uh, the funds required for the architect to do that additional work, uh, they say would have to come from the town. Uh, under information items, there was a presentation of a draft. I know that many of you were there. I know a lot of townspeople were there. And just, it is not possible for me to include everything that was in there. But I think it'd be very valuable for everybody town folks and council members uh, to access that presentation on the IQM2 uh, website. Just one of the things I point out, each object code now has a tab which is a hyperlink uh, and it specifies historical uses in detail. So if you see a line item for X and you click on that, that figure, you'll get a, uh, an itemized breakdown of how that money is spent. Um, based on my own experience of having seen these things for a while, I think it's a it's a nice step forward and will help people in understanding uh, the specifics. Um, uh, I will say that uh, Mr. Geneva, who is the special ed director, has talked about uh, uh, a five-year increase of 12% in the number of our special ed students uh, with an operating budget increase of 10% during this time. But revenue uh, from grants and tuition has decreased by 25%. His point in general is that the costs keep rising uh, and the revenues that we're receiving continue to drop, which puts more and more of a burden on the town. Uh, finally, there was one issue that was discussed in some detail, but um, students that go to uh, magnet schools in other towns have the option of returning to their home schools uh, to play sports. Um, students who would have NFA as a, as a uh, hometown school. Because NFA is a quasi-public school in ways that you know, it can have some significant effects, those kids were not afforded the opportunity to go back to NFA to play. And some of those students that come and ask Dr. Grenier when he was here for permission to play at Ledger High School, which the CIAC uh, cleared. The board has been discussing whether or not to allow that commitment to continue. And what they've decided at this point is those students would continue to participate through the spring, but no commitments being made for future years. Thank you for your patience on that. Okay. Any questions for Councilor Kaporty? Okay, Councilor Sons, what do you want to say? WPCA held its regular meeting at 7 p.m. on Tuesday, January 28th in Council Chambers. WPCA heard a presentation from the Ledyard Ecclesiastical Society regarding the proposed plan for Ledyard Senior discuss ways to get town water to the development and considered several alternatives. The developer will be coming to the town council in the future with a request that Ledger consider extending public water and fire protection to the development as one option. Um, Mr. David Holdridge also spoke on behalf of the Tritown Trail and asked that the WPCA mention in the contract discussion regarding utilities and then willingness of Groton to even discuss the Tritown tail, Trail and access to the Groton Reservoir with Ledger as a sore point Two items that were not on the agenda that were added to it were uh, the Via Verde development and the Grant Utilities invoices. Members of the WPCA reported that they visited WPCA sites to assess the structures and excess inventory. Building a country club, which had a fire several years ago, presents a ser serious liability to the town. The building hasn't been torn down because the building houses equipment for the agitators in Highland Lake. Several other buildings present a hazard as well, and there was discussion about the fact that the town owns the facilities, but the 
WPCA has administrative control over it. Um, there was also discussion about a proposal from SmartLink slash AT&T to install a cellular antenna in the Route 117 water tank. The representative from SmartLink has been invited to attend the next WPCA meeting. Crowd Utilities outlined their policy for antenna installations and oversight process and procedures for accessing those installations. Installing equipment on a water tank must be undertaken with care because improper installation can result in voiding the warranty on the tank, uh, including the interior and the exterior surface coatings. Under the newly added Via Verde topic, the WPCA authorized the chair to sign an agreement modifying the service area map with SWA, the Southeastern Connecticut Water Authority. Um, and this matter, in my opinion, should require, require careful research and full knowledge of state service area regulations because changes to the service area map signed in 2006 and 2011 may not match. <coughs> the WPCA should further investigate the definition of service areas versus extended service areas, which may have an impact on how the Verde uh, and, and that development obtain water and from which water service WPCA voted to recommend the town council authorize the mayor to sign a three-year agreement with Grant Utilities and to also request a bid waiver for the agreement, which was discussed earlier here tonight. Um, I have an update on the Avery Hill pump station. As of last week, it was being manufactured. Uh, the expected delivery date is the end of March, and the contractor is ready to pour the concrete pad, but the weather hasn't been cooperating. Um, because it's so cold, once pour the concrete, 30 days to cure before the building can be constructed. So at this time, it looks like the pump station could be turned on by the end of May if the weather cooperates, which it doesn't seem to do. Um, in its final action of the meeting, um, the WPCA elected um, officers for the coming year. Ed Lynch is the new chair, and Mike Cherry will continue as the vice chair. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sons. Any questions? Yeah. I thought we decided a few years ago that putting antennas on the water tower was not in our best interest. Is that kind of where we're going? We, we did look at it. Um, there was a contract and a proposal from a company that uh, wanted to install, and, and I have mixed feelings about this, but this is what happened. Um, the company wanted to install an antenna on the water tank, but they also, in, through the contract, locked out any other provider. They said, we control the tank, and we'll put anything else up there that we want. We said we didn't think that was a good deal for the town. This is a little bit different because it's AT&T, not a broker, if you will, or, or an aggregator. So it's it's a better deal for the town. Um, and because Groton Utilities has procedures for how to do it and do it right, it's at least being considered by the WPCA. So I'm not saying we're going to do it or not do it, but, but they're considering it. And they invited the, the smart as long as we brought up the water tank, are we uh, funding maintenance on that? We've been paying it a few years. Are we putting money Not to my that? knowledge. So uh, that question um, goes back to when we built the tank. Um, we should be setting aside funds every year in a, in a capital account under the WPCA. So because repainting that tank when it comes due, about 15 years from when it was built, which I think was 2006 or so, um, is not a, it's not a significant Not every year. Um, I can't say whether they are this year or not, but most years in the past we have not set money aside. So it's a coming liability. Thank you. Councilor Prince, do you have a report from the Municipal Building Committee? Uh, uh, the Building Committee met last Thursday. I discussed it with Fortune. I was not able to oh, okay. attend the meeting. Uh, they also had a walk of the site uh, this afternoon.
see what actually has to be put in there. For instance, sprinklers, we know that we're, certainly we have the water pressure for sprinklers, but uh, there it is, uh, it, it, it can be arranged such that they are not required, and we're working on that because we know the sprinkler would be a very expensive commodity to add to the bill. Um, the, the, we just kind of have a field walk today Please, if the, if the forecasts turn out great, what they uh, are saying right now, uh, you know, please avoid using the roads uh, during the, the rush hour. Especially, uh, it gives our it gives our town and the state a chance to catch up with the roads, even though they will be working. Uh, I'm sure as soon as the first snowflake hits, uh, we have instituted a parking ban. Many of you should have already gotten that message on your phones. If you didn't get the message on your phones, you should sign up on the site or ever bring. Website and uh, get your family and yourselves, yourselves on there. It's very good information that comes through on that, uh, both for storms and during the year when there are traffic problems, accidents, outages. Very effective. So we have a, uh, instituted a parking ban beginning at midnight tonight. So when you go home, please uh, put your take your cars, your vehicles off the town roads. Uh, get your family's cars off the town roads. Possible if you're physically able, if you could, after uh, everything settles out, keep the storm drains clear because we know we're going to get a thaw one of these days. <coughs> uh, you want to avoid flooding, also clearing fire hydrants if, if possible. Uh, I, I have received Council Dabrowski's letter re regarding CBA. We've already begun to take action on that. Uh, we've discussed it with the CBA uh, uh, admin person and they start this. that type of feedback. Uh, whenever you have feedback about the website or any of the IT information, uh, we will act on that. Uh, we're continuing work on the budget. Uh, we have received all the department recommendations uh, and uh, the finance director and myself are going through that. Uh, we're reviewing the budget requests and I've already, you know, I started at, at, at option A, which was, you know, uh, in accordance with Council of France's directions, then we went to uh, we went to option B, which was hey, uh, you know, keep the budget uh, to a zero to the greatest extent possible. Uh, we're ready to move to option C, which is we need to look at some serious, serious uh, uh, recommendations on the budget. I appreciate uh, Council Eichelberg, uh his comments. The problem is, I, I I also agree with Councilor uh, Forty, it, it, and and the issue is that over the years, uh, as long as I've been involved in budgets, we kind of take the same approach. We start with last year's budget, we put in all the things that kind of have to be increased, uh, and then we whittle away at it. There's an interesting quote in today's paper from another town of someone who says, you know, we keep shaving, shaving. We send we. Say with that shaving, we save the taxpayer about ten dollars, uh, but we've shaved all. There's nothing left to shave, uh, and I believe that this budget is clearly proving that we need to change the paradigm we use for budget development. We need to emphasize the need to continuously evaluate not just the services we provide or the cost of those services but rather what are the legitimate services that we as a municipality must provide. Uh, again, it's no longer practical to just shave and, and look at individual line items for the $10 and the $50 uh, line. We, we can't do that. Uh, the question I would ask everyone today is, 
if you were building a general government today, if you were building a general government today, what would it consist of in terms of departments, staffing, and services? And to do that, I believe we have to look globally. We have to look beyond just, you know, uh, individual departments, individual buildings. Uh, I know uh, what I'm starting to do is, and I'm telling my staff to do this, is, you know, when when you have positions that are vacant or when, when you have, uh, you know, individuals that, uh, you know, moving throughout the town hall, you have to look at it not just in terms of your department, but what can, what can individuals and, and, and people do throughout the town in terms of providing services. The problem is when when we when we shave away these services and 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 do things like that, I don't think we're being fair to the taxpayer, and I don't think we're being fair to our employees either, who we expect to do more and more uh, in the hopes of saving you know saving some money. So I think we're at a point now where we need to have serious serious discussions about what is the legitimate uh, the legitimate function of town government municipal government. Uh, what is, again, look at it in terms of where are those services provided uh, in the private sector, in nonprofit agencies, uh, in other towns, what can we do? We Obviously there's not enough time, time to do that necessarily with this budget, but I hope to begin you know, that dialogue throughout the coming year as to you know, what, what does the town government in Ledyard provide and is that legitimate service? Uh, on the budget issue, I was a bit discouraged by the governor's presentation and also by the legislature's response. Uh, you, you may have remembered that there, uh, there was a, a big expose, you call it an expose, I don't know what they were exposing that everybody didn't know, about the budget, uh, the uh, pension issue in the state. The, the pension liabilities in the state, uh, if, if, it were, if, if the state were a business, they'd be bankrupt. Uh, but we, we don't necessarily attribute that to government. Uh, and so we have this big expose. The governor makes this presentation, and then the legislature responds to it. And you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone that addressed that particular issue. Uh, there was a, an article in the, the paper where local legislatures, the legislators, there were about 10 of them, gave their priorities for the upcoming legislature. I mean, it would make your head spin to, to read some of these things they're talking about. Not one of them mentioned addressing pensions. And I know it's difficult. I know it's, I know it's, it, it's a matter of uh, contract obligations. But the fact is, someone needs to begin the dialogue. Uh, similarly with bonding. You know, we all know Connecticut's bonding and, and where we are with that. And of course, it, it's unfortunate because, as Councillor Gavorty says, I mean, we're looking to get some of that largesse when we go to build schools. But the fact of the matter is we will never recover the economy in this state until we address the fundamental uh, government uh, weaknesses we have in terms of our finances. And again, on our end, it's a, it's a little bit frustrating because we as a municipality uh, do what we're told, which is to balance our budget. We don't have any leeway in that. Uh, we can't borrow for operations. I think it's, it's, it's a discussion we need to have. I certainly welcome, as was said, I welcome anyone's comments on that if you have ideas. Uh, because we, I, I'm encouraging my, uh, the employees of the town to think differently. And I think we don't have really much choice in doing that anymore. Uh, thank you. Any questions for the mayor? Okay, moving on. Um, old business, new business. Um, Consent calendar. Okay. Uh, any change to the agenda? Anybody want to add or take anything else? Okay. Move the consent calendar. Second. Okay. Uh, Roxanne, you want to pull the roll, please? Mr. Eichelberg? Yes. Mr. Freyas? Yes. Mr. Gavordi? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mr. Bratton? Yes. Mr. Sons? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Administration Committee, Councillor Eichenberg. Okay, so I'll make a motion to appoint Ms. Emily Smith, unaffiliated with 41 
Moral Leaf Drive, Yales Ferry, as an alternate member of the Water Pollution Control Authority for a three-year term ending April 11, 2017, filling a vacancy left by Mr. Juber. Second. Any discussion? I can provide a little background. Um, I, I was the one who uh, spoke with Ms. Smith about volunteering for the PCA. She actually has a recent degree and a background in water quality, and I think she's going to be an excellent addition to the WPCA. Perfect. Thank you. Roxanne, you want to call the rule? Yes. Mr. Forty? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Mr. McGrath? Yes. Mr. Soms? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mr. Eichelberg? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. You want to continue, Council Eichelberg? Um, so I will make a motion to adopt the proposed Gales Ferry Landing Lease Policy Guidelines as contained in the draft dated January 23, 2014. Second. Um, these policies basically, because we're trying to develop an incubator, a business incubator at, at Gales Ferry Landing, these policies help to define the way we're going to look at the occupants, um, some of the guidelines that we'd like to use in allowing tenants to come in um, and uh, help them to develop their business. Any further? I said, I said one question, and one of the things that uh, had been discussed in previous uh, council, council, town council sessions was the length of the incubation period. I was here it's three years. I guess I would like some background on where that number came from and why we think that's the appropriate number, given the type of business we're being discussed in here, and whether we think that's reasonable at the starting rent that we're coming to, what the commercial market rate is for equivalent space, and whether the businesses are And I believe Councillor Allen was involved in helping develop those guidelines. Yeah, I worked on that, and um, the, the numbers of five years were thrown around, around along with three years. And the feeling was that given the, uh, the rates that are being provided to these startup businesses, they should certainly be able to get up and running fairly well over that three-year term. And the escalations, though percentage-wise they appear larger, dollar-wise it's still very small. And so it, it gives these companies, these small businesses, a great opportunity to get up on their feet and be ready to go into the, <coughs> the private sector where they hopefully need to be after that three-year term. So we felt that was a, a reasonable time frame. What it, what it today, um, today, what would be starting and then the three-year escalation? Oh, the, today's rates? yeah. On, well, the market, the, the rates that are there are about 60% below market. Okay. It's substantial. So uh, the, I don't I don't recall the exact percentages that it steps up, but it steps up each year of the three years. If a company chooses to stay three years, they don't have to. But um, the percentage increase amounts to I think a dollar, dollar fifty a square foot on a yearly basis on an increase. And note that these are guidelines, not necessarily hard fast rules. So uh, considerations might be made at, at the end of three years. Well, I mean, if you're going to put go to the next agenda item, it's the standard lease, and that standard lease has an option year and a second option year, that's three years, so the guidelines align with the lease. Uh, and, so, and, and, and they do. And so you're going to be at that third year at the market rate. There isn't going to be any leeway to go anywhere else but the market rate. You know, the only difference would be if the market rate escalated for some reason in the time of the lease that you know, is different. I don't think the market would be different. Yeah, I, I don't think we were really intending to have them stay longer than three years. Um, when we had met with some of the businesses in the school at the time, there were some that we felt probably wouldn't benefit from incubation because it had been too long. And the, and the whole concept is incubation. And uh, that's not supposed to be a long process. But again, even there, I would say, you know, if, if at the end of three years we're looking at a business that has been incubated and is ready to move on, but we have no, ter no tenant ready to come in, there might be a consideration of letting that, that business stay another year. Yeah, but there would be a market rate. Market Absolutely, yeah. right. But we're not necessarily saying three years, you're done and out. No, there are guidelines. Yeah. Okay, uh, Roxanne, you want to pull the roll, please? 
Mr. Caporty? Yes. Mr. Marshall? Yes. Ms. Moran? Yes. Mr. Sam? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mr. Eichelberg? Yes. Mr. France? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Number six. So I'll make a motion to approve a proposed standard Gales Ferry Landing lease as contained in the draft dated February 4, 2014 for the facility located at 7 Hurlut Road. Second. And again, as Councillor France pointed out, this, this lease is, uh, does align with the uh, guidelines that we've set forward for Gales Ferry Landing. Um, this lease was again developed by uh, Councillor Allen and others. Um, with those considerations in mind. Okay, you want to call the roll, Roxanne? Well, I did want to also Sorry. point out that for the land use side, we looked at this, that we had tabled it because there were certain amendments or adjustments we had made when we previously approved the same lease document for another tenant. We amended some of the language that wasn't included when land use saw it. Mm -hmm. I worked with Roxanne before it went to admin to update the lease language Yes. Mrs. McGrath? Yes. Mr. Sons? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Yes. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mr. Eichelberg? Yes. Mr. France? Yes. Mr. Caporty? Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed? Number seven. So I'll make a motion to set a public hearing date for February 26, 2014 at 6.45 p.m. in the Council Chamber, 741 Colonel Ledger Highway to receive comments and recommendations regarding the proposed an ordinance amending an ordinance withholding approval approval of building applications for property for which taxes or water and sewer rates charges or assessments are delinquent as contained in the draft dated January 12 2014 second uh, I'd like to note that we when we considered this in administration earlier this evening uh, we did look at uh, the building officials comments um, we did remove uh, driveways from the comments, but we left in um, we left in certificate of occupancy uh, under our idea that if you got a pull if you pulled a building permit, a couple of years went by before you were looking for your CO. In that time frame, you might have developed delinquent taxes, and um, then at, at this point, that or this ordinance would apply. Just a quick, quick question. We're only setting a public hearing. We're not discussing the ordinance. Is that a correct statement? Yes, yes. but and that, but that, but because I gave you the date of February 12 as opposed to what's read there, it's February 10. That's the change we made. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Roxanne, you want to call the roll, please? Mrs. McGrath? Yes. Mr. Sams? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mrs. Davis? Mrs. Davis? Yes. Okay. Mr. Dombrowski? Yes. Mr. Eichelberg? Yes. Mr. France? Yes. Mr. Gaborty? Yes. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. Okay. Finance committee. The finance committee did not move on this action. Okay. Uh, land use planning and public works. Uh, Councilor I'd like, Dombrowski. I'd like to make a motion to approve the installation of a public water main on town owned property at 794 Colonel Lake Highway to serve the proposed Via Verde 2 subdivision. Second. Any discussion on this is that the uh, development that's going through um, the water coming for they want uh, have to be served by common water the best location currently uh, the way the development is being laid out and where the water line ex ex exists the tap off village drive uh, to cross over town owned property currently uh, the property that is owned by the developer in order for water to pass over that parcel property actually have to cross through the wetlands and over two water courses. So, and then eventually, the, after the water line gets put in, the, the property would also then have to be turned over the town for the right way for the water line. So, this kind of just skirts it over, gets the water line out of wetlands, um, and it's already on top of the property. Okay. Questions? Council? So, Thomas. I, I want to provide some uh, background on this, uh, this motion. <coughs> this development has appeared in several different forms over the past few years and several years ago it appeared it first appeared with an iron main going up iron street uh, but 
about 520 feet of main, which the applicant was going to pay for and install on the ground. Um, in my opinion, that was part of what got the development originally approved. Um, subsequent to that approval, the applicant came to the WPCA and asked for relief on three houses that were a long distance from the, uh, the initiation or the beginning of the main. Um, I had some concerns about it, voted against it at the time, um, but, but the relief was granted. So the concern I have with this, with this um, current motion is that the developer has appeared before the Land Use Planning uh, Committee and asked for permission to cross town land. Uh, and, and I made the point that, well, in your original pro proposal, we're installing a water main, which the town would receive as a benefit. Um, and also, you applied for relief from the town, and the town gave up three of the properties that would have been supplied by Lake of Water um, and transferred them to the Southeastern Connecticut Water Authority. And I said that I think it would be a good faith uh, attempt to continue that effort and follow through with the original proposal. Um, what was explained to me was that developer never filed that plan. So uh, he had to reapply, um, and, and he did reapply to uh, the Wetlands Committee, got permission to cross, um, or, or got the Wetlands um, blessing, if you will, to cross townland as opposed to crossing wetland. Um, but through all those discussions, it concerned me that the, and, and there was more to it than that, there were several other attempts to get water to this development. Um, but in none of these um, discussions did the developer ever offer to do something in the town in return for the town. So he's getting a water main across town property, saving quite a few thousand dollars by not installing the plan or the, the main as originally proposed. And my concern is that the town has got nothing in return. Um, my question is, have we attempted to negotiate uh, when the land use planning I asked the question during one of his proposals to bring water in. I said, well, you know, what else would you do for the town? How about if you, at the time, we were talking about installing in Hilltop and Stevens, and I said, well, how about if you pay, repave the road? Um, the answer was not going to happen. Um, so my concern number one is, is that Ledger gets nothing in return. I'm understanding that we really have no choice here. We have to allow this main to cross town property because he is forced to supply water from Ledyard uh, because it runs within 200 feet of his property. Um, but I'm led to understand that we have no choice, but I also haven't heard a legal opinion. I've seen case law uh, from similar precedents from other cases, but it hasn't been presented by a lawyer. So I would at least like the town of Ledyard to contact a lawyer and uh, get an official legal opinion on, on whether the town really has to agree to this. Given what the town has given up, given what the town is not getting uh, in return for this development. So I'm, I'm going to vote no if we, if we do vote on this tonight. Just those are my reasons. If we vote no? Or, or if, 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 no. If, we vote if we vote, I will okay. vote no. We vote I, I don't really have a clear understanding of what our, I mean, I'm told that we have no no alternatives, but I haven't heard a lawyer say that. So are you suggesting that maybe we table it? It's an idea. I, I would support that. Okay. Um, so move to table. There's no discussion. Roxanne, will you pull the roll? I'll second it. So, uh, I think it was 
was, uh, yeah, it was January 16th. Uh, the Southeastern Connecticut Council of Governments, Governor, Governments, met, um, and the meeting was, was uh, in part regarding the, uh, the SCOG, which is the acronym. Their, um, I think, unanimous belief that the current situation with affordable housing and specifically Connecticut Statute uh, 830G, which requires a town to um, allow affordable housing to be built if it does not meet certain cr criteria, um, is not working as originally designed. Um, it's it's a affordable housing is a <coughs> good effort, um, but many towns in southeastern Connecticut failed to meet the criteria and the calculations for affordable housing, and yet at the same time, we all know there are houses in foreclosure, there are houses that are abandoned, there are houses for sale, um, far below market price a few years ago, and these actually affordable homes are not allowed in the formula. So Scott was, was talking about the need to look at this legislation again and allow that existing, actually affordable housing to be um, included in the formula. And Senator Austin made uh, quite a few powerful statements. And my thought was that we should support her and her statements and we should also support the Southeast Council of Government. So, bless the letter. I don't think I need to read it out loud. Background: This issue has come up. Uh, as many know, there, there was a, a property in town that was affordable housing, and this discussion was had uh, exactly that. When you do the calculation, which is based on the median income of the town, uh, a great majority of the houses in town qualify under the formula. The challenge is they're not designated as affordable, and so they don't count the percentage. And, and as Council Solomons alluded to. What it does is it shifts the burden. The burden shifts from the developer to the town to defend why the property can't be developed if it's done with the, under the E30G. And so it really puts a, an excess burden on a town when, in fact, there are uh, more properties than the 10% threshold that the, the state is asking for within the town based on the average income. So certainly a clarification of the way the, the formula is calculated to use actual properties uh, as an example, uh, as opposed to having to have them designated, uh, it would, would be helpful. And I think the supporting of the Senator would be a, a great thing to do. Councilor Marshall. Uh, Councilor Franz, you kind of partially answered uh, my question slash comment. Could you give the full definition of the formula for affordable housing? <laughs> because, I mean, you look at the papers and nothing's affordable, but I mean, what is the, what are we talking about here? Well, it's a percentage, it's a percentage of, your, uh, of your median salary for each town of what you're allowed to pay for housing. And so I don't know what the exact, I don't know what the percentage is, but there's a... a could, uh, could Mike speak to this real quick? Just so that the audience knows what the formula is? Because we haven't, we haven't defined that in full terms two yet. Formulas. There's two there's different two. things. Yes. Yes. And your question is, what's defined as affordable to somebody who's looking for housing? to spend no more than 30% of their income on their housing. And that would include utilities and such. Total cost, 30% of your income on housing. That's what's affordable to an individual. The bright line that comes under 830G is based on median family incomes and family size in your geographical area, which for us is Norwich, New London. And that is a significantly lower figure than the median family income in Ledger Gales Ferry. But that sets a bright line. If you're above that bright line of 10%, the appeal rules in 830G do not apply. If you're below it, they do apply. It's a great law. It's being abused. And that's, I think, what the senator is saying. Right. And, and if I may also continue on. It's a great law to, 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 to make sure that there is enough affordable housing for people in, in anywhere inside the state. But as Mr. Cherry has alluded to, it's being abused um, by the fact that it also has, if you put a affordable housing deed restricted for 40 years, it allows you to take the columns to 
tell the zoning regulation, you can literally throw them out the window and do what you want. And that's the problem. And this is what Senator Austin is trying to help with the, working with the COG to change the legislation that will allow into that 10% criteria housing that is affordable but is not necessarily deep restricted. Councilor Davis, you have a comment? Um, actually, I have a question. Um, is the paragraph about the one unit of affordable housing um, in a three unit apartment house, is that paragraph still exist? No. Yes. I'm sorry, could you clarify, please? You got some yeses and some noes. Fair, 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 fair. Fair. It's, it's in the draft. I think we have the wrong draft on IQM2. Yeah. Don't we pull that out? Yeah. Third draft? Yeah. Okay. Nope. It says it's the right date, but it's the wrong draft. Third to last paragraph. Okay, so is it so there? So is this the wrong draft is on the website? Right, but I mean, it's that paragraph in the, in the right draft. Revised draft re removes that paragraph.